So, cold and wet day in my area of the, uh, of the world. I hope yours is a little bit sunnier and a little bit better. Uh, going out for my, I go for regular walks and uh, I like to think and talk. And I thought maybe this is something I can use for the channel and I can kind of air some of my thoughts. And uh, this one in particular is something that's in the news at the moment that Owen Farrell has decided for the Six Nations to take some time off for his mental health. Um, and that he's going to use it to spend time with his family and get himself together. And I just wanted to talk about why, why I think this is important, both for himself, for England, the consequences, and what this really means. Now, where I want to start this is, I think Owen Farrell gets a lot of flack for some things that I think are fair, but I think he kind of gets bound in and tied in with everything else that kind of gives a general consensus or zeitgeist that he's a bad player, a bad international player, that someone else should be starting at 10 instead of him for England. And you know, maybe I kind of like fell into that trap myself a little bit pre-World Cup, but getting out of breath here, showing my own fitness levels, but the reality that I find is that Owen Farrell proved to me this World Cup that he's a world-class number 10. Attacking-wise, he's gotten better. I think he was always probably a pretty good standard, to be honest with you. He plays what's around him in terms of what he has as tools. He, uh, he enables the forward pack to play well and have good ball and good territory. And he can unleash the backs when he's at 10 rather than at 12. And it's going to be a huge loss for England, I think, in the Six Nations. I think the ov obvious answer for a replacement for him will be George Ford. And I don't think it's a bad choice. I think George Ford's played very well. He's playing very well at the moment for sale uh, in the domestic leagues. And he has played well, I think, for the last three years in a row. Really has kind of put his hand up and said, I want to be taken seriously. And... Um, this is what Charlie Richardson, Charles Richardson, as he now knows, is, is demonetized himself since he moved into sports journalism. I know him because I went to school with him. I haven't talked to him in years, so I'm not saying as this is someone I talk to regularly. I haven't talked to him since I was actually at school, which seems like a lifetime away at this point. But in his article here, he talks about that England need to trust in Ford and they need to trust in Genge. And I kind of agree to a certain extent because Farrell is no longer an option. And with that it comes, I think, a change in tactics and how England have to play. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think Owen Farrell in the World Cup covered over a lot of the cracks within the England team themselves. He is not a liability in defense. In fact, he's quite the opposite. When he doesn't go too high, he is a, a physical specimen in terms of defensive output, which was always the criticism, I think, of George Ford, or the biggest guy, a little bit smaller, tends to get targeted by runners, especially at international level. And obviously, that I think there's a similar comparison, I think, to why Cipriani was never really a go-to for the England number 10 shirt. Defensively, always a bit suspect for me, especially when he played at fullback, and it was really obvious then and I think at international level, you really need to have all 15 be good defensively. You can't have a weak spot. George, to be fair, it's a different, different case for George rather than for Danny Cipriani, just walking onto the road here. Um, because George is, he's never shied away from contact. He's just physically smaller. There's not a lot he can do about it. Um, so that's one aspect where I think Owen Farrell borders over some of the cracks. He's a leader in defence that George will not be able to be. Owen Farrell also has ability to take crap ball that's given to him and do something with it because he's not going to get bullied. Uh, he will kick them out. He will take the ball forward himself. Whereas I think George Ford, to succeed, needs a forward pack that's good at ball carrying that's going to get the team over the gain line. George Ford basically is one of the best fly halves in the world, 
when the team has forward momentum, when they're regularly getting over the game line, when, you know, the, the break is on, the attack is on. He's fantastic. He, he really is really good on that game line and getting the team over the game line once the momentum's built. His kick is good. He can kick the territory. But when the attack is running up against a brick wall, I'm thinking teams like, like Ireland, like South Africa, I think George Ford struggles. And I'm just having a look at crossing the road here. Great. And I think that's where George Ford struggles. And that's where England will miss Owen Farrell. I think the difference for me between the selection of the two fly halves is when Farrell's on the pitch, he can, he can fill in the hole. When Ford is on the pitch, the rest of the team has to modify their play for him. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it will require a change in tactics and maybe a change in selection for England. Obviously, Curry is injured. I think there are reports that he might be back for the Six Nations. I wouldn't bet on it. Apparently, it seems like a very serious injury. It could have been career ending, apparently. Uh, Earl is injured at the moment as well. But I think for England to be successful with Ford, they need a really solid ball carrying eight that can consistently get, get over the game line from scrums, from lineouts, put them on the front foot from that first phase of play from a scrum, from a lineout, to allow the game line to already be broken, and that will really enable George Ford to put George Ford to play. And that raises some questions because the only example England have of that in terms of their current team was Binny Volopola. And I think he's over the hill in terms of England selection, in terms of what he can do for England. So where does that leave us? Well, you want to pick somebody that maybe hasn't had a given a, been given a chance yet. I think Barbary for Bath is the man to do that. Such a powerful runner. And he used to play for Wasps before they went under. And I just remember watching him and thinking, this guy just makes such a difference just being on the pitch with his ball carrying. Can play flanker, I believe. First play eight. Seems to be playing well for Bath at the moment. And I think if Earl isn't back, and even if, he, even if Earl is back, Barbary should be in the squad and he should be getting some chances at eight. If you can get solid ball carrying and get consistently over the game line, it allows George Ford to play the game that he needs to play to be successful and to win. If you have that, at least you have a safety valve and attack that George can utilise for his own success. And then when the game's not on, kick the territory, allow the fours to take over, allow the scrum to become a, an option. If England don't select good ball carriers within their pack and George Ford's the 10, I could see this being a really ugly Six Nations and it could be the end of Borthwick's career as England coach because the rope, the, uh, the tolerance for England playing badly, I think will be very low. England have just come off a great semi-final performance against South Africa, right? It's one game. Played well against Fiji beforehand. There were a lot of questions up until those two knockout games about is Borthwick going to be the man to keep these guys going forward? And they got quelled, but it was one or two games. They need a really solid Six Nations here and a great game plan uh, and what to do with the squad and how to prepare to have success because they're not as talented as Ireland. They're not as talented as France. Probably as talented as Scotland. Probably as talented as Wales. And if you're as talented as those two teams, and you take the coaching out of it, it's coin flip. So right there, you've probably got three losses on the board unless you do something with your coaching. So this is going to be a test for Borthwick. But as a Leicester fan and seeing what he did, I have some faith that he's going to know what to do. Now, that's Ford coming in for Farrell. But there's another aspect to this that I want to touch on briefly before we finish the video here. Owen Farrell has decided to leave international rugby for um, mental health reasons. Uh, there's a lot of criticism that he received, social media abuse, um, basically just nasty, nasty stuff. And <clears throat> you can see this with the referees as well. Wayne Barnes got 
pretty much massively abused as well online. <clears throat> and it's a kind of a continuing theme that I don't like. Yes, I've been critical of players before, I've been critical of referees, uh, I've been critical of coaching, I've been critical of a lot of things, but <clears throat> I think there's a line. And the line that I always try to take is be critical of what they do on the field and leave it at that, leave it at ability, leave it at decisions. You know, maybe you can make a joke about somebody's <laughs> personality, but that if that's nasty, that's over the line. You can make a joke about someone's personality in terms of like just making fun of things and being jovial, but the second the criticism moves past the field, I think that's where it has to stop. And it's certainly played a part, I think, in Owen Farrell's decision to stay out of England for the Six Nations because he received a lot of abuse. And it's unwarranted, you know. I think he's disliked by many in terms of fan bases and maybe other teams and other players. But he's disliked probably for reasons that, you know, if you're basically if you're an England fan, you'd, for me, you don't mind what he does, right? He's always talking to the referee. He's always, he wears his heart on his, on his sleeve in terms of emotions or where he thinks decisions are wrong. Um, he's always trying to do everything in his power to make the team win. He's one of those players that if he's on your team, you love him. If he's not on your team, you hate him. Uh, and to be honest with you, I've always enjoyed his play. Yes, he gets a bit reckless with his tackling, but I think that gets lumped into him being criticized as a player unfairly. And He's a hell of a player and England will miss him in the Six Nations. And uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what England do here. But notice I haven't talked about Marcus Smith at 10. I don't think he's ready for it. I don't think he's the man for it yet. I think he's probably got more of a future at 15 at the moment. He was great at 15, attacking the line at the right, pl at the right places, doing the right things uh, in terms of defensive duties. And I think it gave him more space from 15 to attack in the way that he likes to attack the line. At 10, everything's a bit congested. He's got too many people around him and he can't create the magic at international level that he can at the domestic leagues. So that's what I think. And there's a couple of other fly halves that I think are putting their hand up, hands up in terms of being England selection. But it's probably another video for another time as I've now finished my walk and I'm just standing in the rain, which is pretty grim. But that's all for me. I hope you guys are enjoying your time out there.